All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This time, I'm here with uh, RJ Downard, real and James Downard, and we're going to talk about the uh, mammal reptile transition and uh, other things. He is the head of a project called Troubles in Paradise. So would you like to talk about that? Yeah, um, I kind of slid into this as a, uh, a hobby gone berserk. Uh, the Troubles in Paradise Methodology of Creationism Project uh, at www.tortukin.wordpress.com. Uh, Link in the description. And, uh, yeah, and um, it started out um, because I had a great love of dinosaurs in the 1980s. I, I had a dinosaur love as a kid, and suddenly... Uh, we were in the dinosaur revolution where it's hot-blooded dinosaurs and closer connection to birds and new paleontology and scale models of uh, things that you could buy at, at the store. Uh, and uh, everything kick-started at that point. And this was the same time that young earth creationism was kicking in, uh, back way before you were born in the 1980s, uh, where uh, Dwayne Gish and the present creation science movement was actually getting legislation that would get their stuff in the schools. That was like really dumb. And so I was getting into that research much more and noticing how they were mangling dinosaurs. And then in the early 1990s, the, the intelligent design movement uh, kicked in with Philip Johnson. He appeared on the firing line program, which you may not be aware of with William F. Buckley Jr. Uh, and a conservative pundit, kind of like the baby Dinesh D'Souza of the 1970s and 80s, a patrician okay. Roman Catholic. Anyway. Um, uh, the design movement, one of the big design poobahs, Steve Meyer, was in Spokane, uh, where I live. Uh, he was at Whitworth <laughs> College, uh, and uh, that was before he decamped to Seattle, which is the place where all of the Discovery Institute gang have coalesced like a little festering sore uh, in our state. Uh, and uh, initially, the design movement was not young earth creationism, in the sense that they said you don't have to uh, embrace all this silly young earth creationist stuff to be a, a skeptic of Darwinism. But very quickly it mutated into something much cleverer and much more insidious. It is you don't have to give up your young earth creationism to join us in the big crusade under the big tent to destroy Darwinism because we're never going to quiz you on how many zeros there are in the age of the earth and that's because we never think about that either. And so <laughs> I began to take a look intelligent design actually functioned and I would haunt some of Steve's lectures up here on the Cambrian explosion that were open to the public. Uh, oh. I got one of those gobsmacking reactions of my entire life when I asked him a technical question and he just had this deer in the headlight silence because he hadn't a clue what I just asked him. Anyway, oh, yeah. Um, he, oh yeah, jump in there. I, I talk oh, incessantly. Uh, that's okay. I was going to ask, have you seen a Donald Prothero's uh, Stephen Meyer's Fumbling Mumbling Cambrian Follies? Uh, no, I, I've read a Prothero's book stuff. He's a, a mammal paleontologist, and he's done really nice, wonderful work. Bumps into anti-evolutionism occasionally, but not too severely. Yeah, uh, he, in fact, he ironically... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. A, a, a input here. Oh. I, I don't want to be a monologue. <laughs> I, I enjoy listening to you talk. Uh, I was going to say, he wrote a scathing critique of, of uh, Meyer... And what he talked about on the the Cambrian, uh, which I hmm. have uh, kind of eh, on Cambrian. Just looking up, stuff. I got my main bibliography up because I was just updating it online, and I got a whole slew of Prothero, mainly technical work. Uh, yeah. Me, uh, the reality check. Oh, Stephen Meyer's fumbling, bumbling Cambrian amateur follies. Customer review oh. for twenty. Oh, is a review. Fantastic. Oh, the review of Amazon. I got that in my bibliography. Shoot. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I, I enjoyed the heck out of that paper. Yeah, I, I, it, one of the long-term things will be uh, to deal with the whole Cambrian issue uh, in the TIP project. I'm going to be calling it the Cambrian Burp, uh, which is uh, uh, it, it, it's a fascinating subject, but it's a squishy Definitely. one because you're yes. bumping into the lack of fossil data uh, part, which is inevitable. And that's one mm -hmm. of the reasons why... Um, uh, the reptile mammal transition was such a perfect subject because that is not a problem with the with the reptile mammal transition. And so yeah. I was always wondering, 
why isn't it discussed nearly as much as it should be? Uh, when I quiz people about how much you know about the reptile mammal transition, raise your hand. I don't get a hell of a lot of people raising their hands on it. And that mm -hmm. meant we have a hole in our defense wall. Plus, you, you, you mentioned the Woodmarap article. So we could probably launch into that perfectly because that's delightful. So you, um, anyone that gets some, uh, I suppose I should preface it by saying the whole essence of my tip project is a bit mm -hmm. different from the way everybody else has been handling stuff. Uh, it's, uh, if you look at Talk Origins uh, archive, you're probably familiar with that. Oh yeah, some. Yeah. And a lot of it's really old. Yeah, it's, they're, not, they're not updating it a hell of a lot. But anyway, um, their, their famous quote mine project, which is the delight. But nevertheless, it, they'll talk about some particular stupid thing a creationist writes, and they'll mention a couple creationists that have mentioned it, and then say why it's stupid. Well, the tap, tap tip approach is, what if you looked at every creationist that was doing that? These trends of behavior that you wouldn't if you were just looking at an isolated example. So the first thing I was doing as I began to accumulate, you don't need to deal with everything, but there are certain litmus test issues. Uh, there's a Bonheur quote that is, in fact, non-existent. And therefore, I've been keeping track of every anti-evolutionist that trots out the Bonheur quote, because it, since it doesn't exist to begin with, the only place they could have got it is from a quote mine. Huh. So you're instantly measuring their secondary scholarship by the fact that they have the Bonheur quote in it all. First one where I started analyzing this uh, because I took the old tip chapters uh, that I had written out, which is about a thousand pages worth of junk uh, from the, the 2004 or so, and I began with my introduction, which turned into the new chapter one. And when I got to the punctuated equilibrium section, I then dumped all of my information that I had accumulated on all examples of anti-evolutionists bringing up punctuated equilibrium. And it turns out they fall into two categories. One is the hit and run which is Stephen Jay Gould says there is a problem with the fossil record and here's some authority quotes and blah, blah, blah. And now this disproves Darwinism and gradual evolution. And then right, on to the next right. rock. Uh, but they don't actually apply it to anything. They don't use actual examples of biology or paleontology. They're just doing a hit and run. Steve mm -hmm. Meyer in mm -hmm. Darwin's Doubt is the longest hit and run chapter of anybody that I've ever read on this subject. He never discusses a specific example and I go into that. Turns out there are only two anti-evolutionists who actually try to bump in to the data. And it's Fazal Rana and Casey Luskin. And both of them get all their data wrong. <laughs> huh, okay. So I can state as a categorical that anti-evolutionists do not discuss the, the uh, uh, punctuated equilibrium issue even when they bring it up themselves. And I don't have to guess at it because I catalog all of them. <laughs> so that was the procedure that I was then going to go into in a lot of other litmus test issues, and the reptile mammal transition was one of them. So yeah. when I got around to it in financial desperation, when people were saying, your GoFundMe isn't doing as well, write some, turn some stuff into a book. And so I look through my stacks of material and I go, hmm, what can I do that nobody's ever done before? Duh! Nobody had done a full court press analysis of it before. Well, nobody. There were tons of books on it by paleontologists for paleontologists that people in normal land don't read. Mm -hmm. And the technical literature was all available pretty much. But nobody was going after that. And people like Wood Murat, nobody was going after. Now, it happens to be that the Wood Murat article is the only one that you can get at Answers in Genesis that attempts to deal with the data set. That's it. Really? And it, uh, isn't that amazing? And uh, here's where um, the technology had advanced and my network of connections had advanced. When I did an analysis of Woodmer app uh, in 2006, and it's posted online and I got links to it at my website and all of that, it was a, a multi-part thing. Uh, and uh, I completely revamped it when I redid it for the book. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stuff I didn't have direct access to. I actually had to write uh, Dr. Lowe at the University of Chicago, and he kindly sent me the papers uh, that um, uh, Woodmer App was misrepresenting. Sent him my analysis to make sure that I was getting all of my technical material correct. And Lowe said, you know, you could have been a pretty good systematist if you had taken your thing. And I go, thank you very much. Anyway, <clears throat> um, 
by the time I was doing the revamp now in uh, uh, last year, 2016, um, not only was, did I have that primary source data, but I know a lot more about the reptile mammal transition. So I completely revamped my material to pull apart point by point by point by point by point all the misrepresentations. And uh, uh, in, in I devote a whole section of a chapter to John Woodmer app, depending on the kindness of strangers, uh, about how uh, he's uh, attempting to uh, defuse the uh, the systematics. Uh, if you'll remember, he was trying to criticize cladistic analyses from three primary source papers. And he had all these cute little charts up where he was saying that yeah. there were these reversals of character traits. What's yeah, really I didn't funny, find any papers on reversions, though. Oh, no, and, and none of the papers were about that. But he was insisting in his piece that there were these reversals of traits that he was detecting when he looked up. He did his little, mm -hmm. All he did basically was add up the numbers of the zeros and the ones as, as master groupings, which is preposterous to begin with. Cladistic analyses use numbers to mm -hmm. depict things, but the traits are not themselves numbers. Right. So if you, you might have a situation where um, the presence of a trait is the, the native one and it gets a zero and its absence becomes a derived trait and it gets a one or some other modification of it has a two. But going from zero to one to two, it's just a number. If you had used A, B, and C, it would work just as easily from a cladistic analysis, but try adding A and B and C together and you can see the problem because you're not adding numbers. Right. He, he's missing the point to begin with, but it was worse than that because he yeah. was, yeah. flushing data down the drain. He was using double standards. He was saying, I, I don't use any of these reversing ones in some of my charts when he did. And he never, right, not yeah. once, ever explained what any of them meant, let alone from his own creationist perspective. And it turned out one of these supposed reversing traits was this tiny little bone, smaller than a toothpick, where this itsy bitsy little bump would appear and disappear occasionally, microscopic in size on the bone. And that was a reversal of a trait that was undermining all the evolution of all of these other stuff. And I'm going, holy moly here. So anyway, I went through all of that analysis. There was just, now, a, there was just an apomorphy, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's a developmental reason for a lot of this stuff. I learned an awful lot about the developmental biology of mammals, tracing down the background context of the stuff that Woodmerap's curiosity apparently atrophied at birth and didn't bother to look at. <laughs> Plus, Savage. he never explained it from his own perspective. No, How many didn't. design events yeah. involved? How many kinds are there? It turns out only one creationist, and I discuss him too, a guy named Aaron, uh, M. Aaron, he doesn't even, I, I don't even know his first name this little fellow, uh, at Answers in Genesis in their technical journal, uh, attempts to do a, a cladist or a, a baromenology analysis for one <laughs> family, the Cassiates, of, um, oh yeah, you've grown at baromenology. You must have read some baromenology papers. <laughs> oh, you, you will get me if you bring up baromenology. I have had so many rather frustrating conversations with creationists, yeah, creationists. And, and it's on on the whole concept of a kind actually in the introduction to the book that i'm writing that i'm trying to get published right now which is not going too well um well you can go the same route i did you can go create space and i'll do it open access so bingo friend, i'll give you pointers on that yeah a friend did tell me about that um a few years back um too that i have uh i'm just trying to get it out there different publishers oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to do that. In fact, I still got a bitch at Christine Janice and try to ask if I can contact her agent and stuff and try to get because she. I know she wants. Would like to see me do an illustrated version of, of Slam Dunk. But anyway, hey, um, back to Woodmark. But yeah, the the just the kind the whole kinds thing just makes me so upset because I work. Here I intern is a better word to use. Um, at the LSU Museum of Zoology. Uh, specifically in the Department mm. of Mammalogy. And so Ooh. I am seeing, You're knee deep yeah, in the actual it's great. data. It's yeah. really it's really interesting. I actually I um I've met some really interesting mammologists from Australia, uh from different parts of the world. Uh they're really interesting people. Um but 
the whole concept of of these things not being related to each other because one thing I was thinking about the other day was true then necessarily these organisms shouldn't at a fundamental level be related to each other. There should be a distinct box for these guys and a distinct box for these guys. And we yeah, shouldn't... And they claim to do that. Yeah. With the word monobaramin? Uh, I've, heard of, I've heard of baramin, I'm not a monobaramin. I'm education here because this is a smoking right. gun of creation is stupid. Uh, Kurt <laughs> Wise is the reason why baraminology exists. Uh, him and Todd Wood and Kavanaugh and all the rest. They were the young Turks who were trying oh, to be Wood. science. I mean, you got to give them, they're trying desperately. They, they were attempting to actually settle down and figure out, following uh, Marsh, who was a creationist from the 1940s, who coined the word baraminology. It means uh, uh, the, he, it's a Hebrew neologism for created kind. And right. Right. all of the little fiddly bit details, hollow baramins and monobaramins and apple baramins, are wise, who is a paleontologist, studied under Stephen Jay Gould, has an actual real live degree in it. Um, he would apply all of, yes, your eyebrows go up, but he really does. I, that must have been an interesting experience for them both. But anyway, he <laughs> took all of that experience. Uh, a, ho a holotype, for example, is the fossil uh, yes. that is used as the defining characteristic for something. And so the holobaramin is the baraminological counterpart of that. So he's basically taking the terminology of cladistic taxonomy and then mapping it on to the baraminology structure. Now, a holobaramin is a created type. The baramin would be the full type, but the hollow baramin would be the fossil representation of it. A so like monobaramin. Like um, uh, no, the, the, it's just the, the well, from a creationist, because the only people who do baramonology are creationists, younger right. creationists. So basically, what you're seeing is what was preserved in the flood. Okay. And so you may not have a fossil representation of a baramin because it didn't get gumped up in the flood. Oh, that's another can of worms. We'll open that later. But, Inside of a baramin, if you imagine a big blob that represents a created kind, there can be natural variation. And as we all know, in order to get to the current speciation, you have to have super fast speciation post-flood. So there are yeah. these things they call monobaramins that are uh, lineages of natural branching speciation evolution within a created kind. You know what one of the monobaramins is in their view? Hmm. The horse sequence. The whole horse sequence from Heracotherium all the way to Ex Equus have conceded that is a monobaramin. At the same time that Ken Ham keeps insisting that there is no relationship between any of those, the, the baraminologist 10 years ago flushed it down the toilet as a monobaramin. <laughs> Ken Ham oh does not read his own baraminology people. Posts it on his own website. I don't think he ever bothers to read it. That's what you can discover from a source methods approach. Oh <laughs> anyway, baraminology of uh, this Aaron guy is the only one who has ever tried to tackle the reptile mammal transition. And he picked a obscure family, so obscure that it doesn't even show up in Hunt's summary of the thing at Talk Origins, the Cassiads, that are these weird ones that have extremely tiny oh, heads. I know them. The, yeah, they have very That's tiny true. heads on a great big body. They're weird looking little critters. They're, They're largely... Uh, are they advanced pelicosaurs or primitive pelicosaurs? Yeah, yeah, and they're off on a sideline. So yeah. already he picks a group that's a sideline, mm -hmm. and it's a small group with a limited fossil record. And then in the course of things, he removes a third of the data. <laughs> I go into all of this in slam dunk. It's hilarious to see him just whittling things down, and he whittles it down to the point where he has a baraman. Yay! Except the sources that he drew on, in his own source citations, directly linked up the Cassiads with almost Cassiads that he had to literally step over and never discuss in his own analysis. So, oh boy, that's a really not defendable baromet. And he's only got all of the rest of the reptile mammal transition to tackle. <laughs> now, are you familiar with the probatognathids? Yeah, those are uh, very advanced uh, therapsids, very derived. And they are the smoking gun of slam dunk. They are a they, critter that should be as well known as T. Rex because they are it's a, a sister to mammals, aren't they? They're the double jaw. 
the, the uh, diarthognathus and probanognathus yeah. are the ones with the double jaw hinge. Right. And yeah. they were predicted yeah. in advance by Robert Broom in 1912. Did you know about that, puppy? No. No, I did not. Well, you will when you read my book. This is information that's been known in the field for years, but nobody had ever really bothered about it. it there's some stuff that was done on it years ago. Robert Broom is a guy that later on became far more known for doing australopithecines down in Africa. That's where you would probably would hear his name. He yeah. was actually kind of a yeah. theistic evolutionist, kind of a cross between Alfred Wallace A.R. de Chardin. He didn't like Lamarckism. He didn't like Darwinism. He was writing in the period at the turn of the 20th century when um, Darwinism was in eclipse. They were kind of, they didn't know anything about DNA. They didn't know about a lot of stuff that we know now. Anyway, he was a quirky little fellow and a prickly guy who picked fights a lot uh, with people. And so uh, there, uh, there's a technical article that went into his biography and stuff that I cite in the book on it. But anyway, um, we have to remember the, the, the trend of the fossil lines. Um, and, and for the, the viewers, we got to tell about why this is so interesting because it has to do with our jaw. But all the other vertebrate transitions, they're basically tweaking the things that exist. A bird skull is essentially a slightly modified dinosaur, and it's a slightly modified archosaur, and therefore slightly modified diapsid. It's You've very boring. The, have you seen the, uh, there's a recent the, paper on, um, what was it like? Uh, oh, where they tweak the, the beak bone? Yeah, it was like the frontonasal. Um, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. There, I, I cite that in the yeah. book because I go into some of the the material on paleogenomics. So it, there's, uh, I got the reference in on that. Is I think Debullar or something like that. Oh, uh, it was did very it. interesting paper. Several, several different papers on the subject over the last few years. What was interesting about it is they found a different gene that connected up that the other people hadn't expected. So there was a bit of a controversy about this, and it shows how complex it is. I go all into that in Slam Dunk. You got to get Slam Dunk. I got all this Indeed. crap in the book. Anyway, um, the thing about the reptile mammal transition is there is a giant discontinuity, which has a puzzle to it. Uh, if you're familiar with, the, with biology, all mammals start out with the reptile standard jaw layout, where they have the squamosal, the dentary, and uh, yeah, quadrate. And it's with the quadrate and the, everything. It's all yeah. just normal reptile layout. And in the course of our embryology, that dentary bone expands and expands and expands and expands until it bumps into the squamosal bone up in the skull, at which point the remaining bones migrate up into the middle ear, which we use yeah. for hearing. Yeah. This has been known since the 1830s, before Darwin. Right. Creationists ever mention it. Well, you know, those pesky facts can't have those. Can you guess a number? A number of? How many creationists mentioned the embryology data? Is it one? Nope, it's zero. It's zero. I don't have to guess. I count. <laughs> Not a single idea. There's one at a talk, uh, the uh, uh, Truth in Science that comes perilously close to noting the data. And uh, because he has to step right over it in one of his sources. And uh, Philip Johnson and Dwayne Gish both in principle knew about it because it was mentioned in sources that they directly cited. And somehow it just slipped their mind, not to mention. So it's literally a zero. This is called data suppression. Anyway, um, the fun part is by the uh, um, later 19th century, you had an interesting puzzle to solve. How the hell do you go from an animal that has a jaw hinge from the articular to the quadrate mm -hmm. to one that has a squamosal dentary connection uh, right. with a giant dentary bone? How do you do that? Um, we can see the embryology thing, but what's going on in the actual dynamics of it? And uh, in, the, in the 1890s and more, they were starting to find these weird synapsids that had only one skull opening instead of the two that are in the diapsids. And they had this really, Dimetrodon is an example of one, it has this kind of big dentary bone. And mm. it started occurring to them, you know, maybe this is the group that the mammals evolved from, you think, kind of, maybe? And a broom took his time off of sniping with other people when he was dinking around in the, in the Karoo down in South Africa, where he lived. Huh. And he's saying, you know, I'm going to think about this. That's an interesting problem. How the hell do you get from one jaw system to another and be totally functional every step of the way, totally evolutionary, natural, slow, gradual? How the hell can you do that? I figured it out. There's only one way it'll work way this can work 
it's got to have the existing jaw hinge and then the squamosal dentary has to be joined as a secondary jaw the jaw the skull has to morph around so that the squamosal is right next to the the quadrate and the dentary attachment has to be right next to where the articular is otherwise the muscles won't be pulling in the same direction Okay. So the whole suite has to warp around and the muscles have to form in exactly one relationship. It's the only way it'll work. No animal exists that has that arrangement. No living animal has that arrangement. No fossil was known to have that arrangement. But it's the only way it'll work if evolution is true. Well, in the 1930s, they started digging up bones with exactly that configuration. And Diarthognathus brumi was named in his honor because it was a fulfillment of his prediction of the only possible way that this can work. Now, if design is true, if the creator is creating stuff 4,500 <laughs> years ago or 6,000 6, years ago in the case of the young earth creationist or 200 million years ago, in the case of those intelligent designers that accept all of those extra zeros hmm. was the designer a dunce to go out of their way to deliberately design forms that gratuitously match robert broom's prediction what did, did god really like robert broom an evolutionist because he really wants to make their day in the 1930s when they got hitler to worry about but hey at least they can have a fulfilled evolutionary prediction that yeah, doesn't that actually, seem very plausible jump yeah, in yeah. Uh, that actually reminds me. Um, I made a video uh, a few weeks ago titled uh, "Pointing to Common Ancestry," and in that video, I talk, I point out a bunch of different transitions between organisms. Uh, and at one point, I was talking about the link between non-avian dinosaurs and birds, and I point out that Microraptor was actually predicted in the early, very early 1900s or very late 1800s. So the 1890s or the idea of having a four-limb thing. Another one I, I allude to it because a, a bird evolution is kind of a side counterpart uh, mm -hmm. to a mammal evolution because of the genes that are involved. And there's another one. There's a, a membrane flyer, bird-like form in the dinosaur group that oh, the, woman was, the woman paleontologist I cited in the book. Uh, the, the woman paleontologist predicted that it would turn out to be a membrane flyer that it would have feathers, but it actually has a membrane of skin flap. That's actually, and that turned out to be the case as new fossils were done. Uh, Brian Nash uh, called attention to it, and I included that in the work. The reason why the feather issue turns out to be relevant is that the genetics of hair formation and feather formation are the same system. That you right, have the deep black codes right? that are buried deep down in the archosaur group before the split between diapsids and synapsids, and mm. then it gets more specialized as time goes on, and what it involves in part is the difference between um, pimpling inwards versus dimpling outwards uh, yeah. as to the, how the things do. The, the bone morphological protein, sonic hedgehog, which is my favorite gene because it's just, you know, who says scientists don't have a sense of humor? Uh, you know, and all a, of these, an inhibitor named uh, uh, robot Nikonin? After the, after the video game because it, yeah. there was already a hedgehog gene uh, that produced these kind of prickles on, on fruit flies. And so when they were looking at this thing that was a cousin of it, they said, heck, hedgehog. <laughs> uh, and there's quite a few oddball little gene names popping around there where people have probably a little too much drink uh, um, during the, the evening and decide, oh, let's go ahead and call it that. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, the, the, the dynamics, there's a whole slew of papers. Uh, you may or, not, uh, may or not be familiar with Robert, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, put it out, Richard Prum and, and uh, Alan Brush. You will so, if you no. read my book, and also Alabardi. Um, there are these people that have done the, the uh, genetic and developmental biology thing. Prum and Brush, uh, uh, Brush in particular gets authority quoted by creationists all the time. And in fact, there was a creationist that I bumped into down in the Palouse uh, lecture who haunts their Darwin days. And he was saying, oh, don't you know that there is no homology between scales and feathers? And uh, Alan uh, Brush, the scientist, said that. And he says, I bet you're quoting the 1996 paper, aren't you? I read your stuff. You haven't bothered to see what Brush has done since then, have you? Ho, ho, ho. See, Brush and Prum actually got together because they were both working out. They were doing the Robert Broom trick. How do you mm -hmm. get feathers to evolve? It's got to be consistent with what we can see in the developmental biology. So they inferred step by step the proto feather concept, and they began to do work together. 
And then there's another uh, biologist, Alabardi, who has done that even more on the placode level, and he's had a whole bunch of technical papers in that. I cite all of that in the book. And um, what's really interesting, um, one of the proto-feather transitional forms has been trapped in amber. And I cited that one as well. That in is that fact, one of the when they ones? when they looked at it, hmm? yeah, one of the early protofilament ones, where the thing is just starting to fray, that was predicted okay. to exist on evolutionary grounds by Prum and Bush, turns out to actually have existed and is preserved in amber fossil. And in fact, the people writing the papers pointed out that the little micro details on it meant that you could skip one of the transitional stages, that you could go directly. $200, it was simpler than what Prum and Brush had even worked out. The science keeps on, I call them the fossil genie uh, in the book, uh, where you know the, 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 there's this ridiculously obliging fossil genie out there that just seems hell-bent to create things that match evolutionary predictions, and somehow there, those intelligent yeah. designers never get, a, get that help. Yeah, there <laughs> are. Um, I, uh, TikTok is another example. Mm -hmm. uh, she yeah. even predicted I, on I uh, Ellsbury Island. Really there is uh, actually because another... it... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Keep going. Oh, no, no. Uh, I was just going to say on Tiktaalik, yes, the, 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 we, the whole interesting thing about Tiktaalik and its various cousins, which anti-evolutionists, idiots at Discovery Institute mangle this stuff all the time, is it doesn't dawn on them the significance of what's going on. Right. M is forming underwater. It's not an adaptation to land. It only later on gets to be an adaptation of land. And I, 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 for, I, with Slam Dunk, if nobody knows anything about the creation evolution issue, I wanted them to have a lot of the benchmarks on the field in the course of the discussion so that they can kind of get a feel for it if they didn't know diddly about it before. And so in mentioning that we're tetrapods, we're four-limbed, and that we're pentadactyl, um, but we're pentadactyl five-digit now, we didn't start out that way. That right. the earliest metropods all have like six, seven, eight fingers. Oh yeah, it's actually. Uh, it turns out. Oh sorry, I'm sorry. I, I keep interrupting you. Sorry. No, no, no. You got to jump in, otherwise I'll talk indefinitely. Uh, I was gonna say, uh, Acanthostega has eight fingers. Ichthyostega has seven. Tularpetin has six, I think. And then. Yeah. You know what causes that? No, what causes that? We know. I cited the paper. This has been known for quite a while. It's alanine repeats in the HOX13 gene. <laughs> more alanines, more digits. Less alanines. Uh, repeats, uh, you get less digits. Really, and, it's alanine. Oh, uh, the, there's no acid, alanine. Really? And so uh, that, that oh. uh, yeah. Uh, it, and so if you get extra alanines in that particular gene, that's the thing that determines how many onlogin you have. And the onlogins then get turned into digits when another bunch of other genes come in, including bone morphological protein and a whole bunch of others. Now, I got a bunch of technical papers that I cited on that point. And then the interesting thing is uh, it looks like the the boring tetrapod pentadactyl mode that we settled into is adaptive because once you get up on land six seven eight fingers are a drag they're comp they're, they're too many and mm -hmm. so there's an adaptive selection pressure to settle in on five now the fun part comes in when you see the big divide between diapsids and synapsids because our boring mammals are really boring and it's very small list of critters that don't have five digits um, which is a false six digit you got the um, uh, horses where they've eliminated the digits and it's one toe that they're stepping on and we actually have the transitional genus, the dino uh, 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 hippus one, where you actually have one of the species that still has the, uh, the vestigial toes. You know, the fossil genie is really busy all the time on this one. Yeah. But mammals pretty much are kind of dull and then when you get into cetaceans, and it happened again with other marine reptiles, that selection pressure goes off again and you get multiple digit phalanges and it splays all over the place when you get into cetaceans and there's genetic work that's now being done on that. Now, move over to dinosaurs. They've got a completely different dynamic and they drop digits like nobody's business. They like the dinosaurs four, just three fingers. in the case of the tyrannosaurs. And so there was for a while a big kerfuffle, and there still is for creationists that don't keep up with the literature, as to where the bird digit hand came from. Because the birds have digits two, three, four, and dinosaurs have one, two, three. They're talking, the that's the, the frame shift, uh, it's the frame shift Bingo. of the fingers, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. And that, of course, has been settled now in yeah. the last 10 years or so. They started out doing research on feet, uh, bird feet, because it was a lot easier. 
Uh, and then because the, 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 anybody who's seen a chicken wing uh, knows how scrunched all together the bones are. And so there's been a lot of de derived features on that. Exactly. They're tasty little things. Yes, yes, the buffalo wings. Yes, they ain't buffalo wings. Those are damn synapses. They're in the wrong class. Let's get our taxonomy straight for our uh, corrosive, overly uh, sauced uh, um, um, football snacks. Damn it. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> The, um, uh, the thing I, I mentioned, the Anlagen, that fancy little German word that is used in there, is what you end up is little buds they turn into has to do with the other connections that pop up. And what happens is the thing that says thumbish that sticks out on the side can jump in a frame shift to the next digit. And that's been verified right. experimentally. And so Alan Fiducia and the gang have tended to stop talking quite so much about that frame shift issue. Yeah, it's, it's really weird. sad because I, um, he actually got his, uh, was it his, his PhD at LSU, Baton Rouge, I think, or something like that. Could he got, be about Fiducia. Yeah. yeah Alan that, Fiducia. Way, am I pronouncing it correctly or is it Fiducia? I've literally never heard it pronounced aloud, so I don't know. I think it's, I, a mammologist friend of mine said Fiducia. Mm, that's what, that's how I've been pronouncing it, but you know, I once said Goethe for good as so you know, and the friend who knew German hit me with something, you know, they you idiot, and I've never I've never made that mistake, but I had not heard of it, and I thought it was fiducia. Yeah, I've yeah, I call him the Fred Hoyle of bird evolution in the slam dog. Oh boy, that's that's kind of savage. Uh, but, but yeah, I've... I know it is sad. It is sad. Uh, the, I don't know if you're, here's where this comes in with with uh, Alan uh, with uh, uh, Richard Prom again, because. Uh, are you familiar with the flap of how Fiducia did a 180 degree turn on feathered solarosaurs? Uh, no, I'm aware of uh, solarosaurs. And I, didn't and know I they go had into feathers, it in though. the book. This is a hilarious example. Richard, I found out about it because Richard Prum just went guffaw in the awk about it. Uh, because uh, for years and years and years, Fiducia was insisting that birds and dinosaurs are totally unrelated. And the, one of the things you could tell about this is that, yes, there are a bunch of dinosaurs that look superficially similar to birds. That's just a, a convergent coincidence that solarosaurs seem to look so much like birds or birds seem to look like that, even though uh, one of the Archaeopteryx was, was originally classified as Compsognathus, which is a solarosaur in the actual thing, you know, but that's just, you know, convergence, They're completely separate. <laughs> and in the 1990s and 2000s, they started finding and continue to find feathered solarosaurs up the yin-yang. So suddenly, Fiducia does a 180 degree turn and now is insisting solarosaurs are flightless birds that only coincidentally resemble dinosaurs. Whoa. <laughs> same animal, same anatomy. Nothing about them has changed other than the fact that they now are finding these logger state deposits over in China where they're feathered. And so Brush went, what? <laughs> and, uh, and this has been mentioned several times. In fact, Michael Denton theoretically even knew about it in his new anti-evolution book, and he had to literally step over the page where it was discussed. And when uh -huh. he had the quote number, he put the number of the page previous. It's like his brain was literally insulating himself from this little hot topic incident that he didn't want to think about. It's a very peculiar detail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I go into all that. Am I am I enticing you to get slam dunk because of all the material that I got on this? I'll have to get it today, um, but uh, yeah. it'll be a uh, while I think before I can read it well, because I before I can read it because uh, mm -hmm. my echoing you. Uh, my echoing you. Oh, a, a little bit, but not much. It's okay. I, I'm hearing you fine. Okay. Uh, I've got. Oh, it's gone now. Okay. I've got a okay. whole bunch of it's books. demons. I've got a whole bunch of books I need to read. Uh, actually, one of them, my mammologist friend gave me um, uh, Gould's book, Wonderful Life, which I'm excited to read. Oh, uh, yeah. Remember, it's really dated. That's the only yeah, yes, difficulty it about it. It's still very interesting stuff. Uh, most of the issues in it are perfectly valid. It's got some right pretty pictures. Um, we know a bit more about uh, the systematics and taxonomy. And the, the big point, hmm. still perfectly valid is that there is an interesting puzzle that the Cambrian are showing extreme disparity and very little diversity. In other words, you've got a lot of body plans going on and very little representation of speciation in them. So it's like one-offs. And the larger picture now, writing 30 years down the road, we'd say is that most of them were ones that did temporarily successful. And then, whoop, they're gone. 
Morello. Uh, I mean, that's just unbelievably the little buggy shaped thing about the size of your uh, you thumbnail. Morella wasn't isn't that um that's supposed that's a um little arthropod little yeah, buggy it, little it thing it's it's about, yeah. very tiny I saw a fossil one up at Drumheller up at Edmonton because um it, uh, their fabulous museum up there the Royal Tyrrell which is I think way better than the Smithsonian because they the talk way. about it's it being a very early uh, protostome isn't it hmm? they talk about it being a very early uh, protostome isn't it oh uh, well it's all in that arthropod group so that you know that 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 no, I'm thinking of Kimberella I'm thinking of Kimberella. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There's, there's some of the names. In fact, in Slam Dunk, there's one of the groups. There's these trithylodontids, and then the other one that, that their the names are so damn similar in the reptile mammal transition that I put a T1 a parentheses and the name and T2. I, I put a separate label on them uh, because uh, I can, I could hardly keep them straight. And if you're trying to weasel your way through uh, some stupid creationist like uh, uh, David Capage barking off on one of these things, you got to remember to keep straight what they are. So I, I use nomenclature. I use crutches. Yeah. And, and tools and that wherever necessary to make that it. Works. There's an ant group. Boy, the ants, when I when I did a little investigation of that, um, I slid into it because of Michael Denton. I don't know if you're familiar with Sveko Mirma. Uh, actually, uh, y yes, I am. I actually mentioned that in the introduction chapter. It's one of the uh, transitions in the, uh, the parasites of ants, the social parasites. Well, it's, uh, well, uh, no, actually, that's something else. A uh, sphecum nope, is this That's protoclavager. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. That's what the little thing that causes ants to behave strange and climb up and get eaten by stuff. That's yeah, right. Uh, yes. Yeah, 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 toxoplasma. I think that one is. Uh, but anyway, um, sphecum is a, um, a wasp ant fossil that was predicted in that's advance right. by uh, E. O. Wilson. That's right. Very briefly, in um, uh, uh, coins, uh, evol uh, why evolution is true, which means. Uh, the Denton literally stepped over it uh, because he cited uh, on the very page where this was mentioned uh, in his new anti-evolution book. And two other of his own cited sources on ants also mentioned speaker mermaids, and he manages to miss them every single time. So I had spotted way back in his 1985 book that he was ignoring speaker mermaids, and I wanted to see whether he was ignoring them again in his 2016 book, and yes, he did. Uh, so I, I, uh, I decided I was going to take a side swipe at him on this. And as a result, I would have to mention the one little paragraph where he mentions ants. And he says that they're typologically fixed. And he has this long rollout for a whole paragraph of all the little diagnostic features of ants and the, the uh, metapleural glands and the uh, pigus, blah, 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 all this jargon, which he never explains. And oh, yeah, so there's really so much, there's so much jargon with regard to to ants i was just when i was looking up information on uh, proto uh, claviger there's just all this there are so many attack uh, or not taxonomic uh, anatomical parts essentially that are there are just twenty thousand effing species of ants exactly now, here's what was fun <laughs> from a source methods point of view first of all I didn't know much about ants, although I had some material on it because I'd read Hobbler and Wilson's big gigantic ant book uh, from uh, the 2000 or so that came out. So I had a, hunt of, a lot of notes on that that I was eventually going to put in the tip project. But here is a spot analysis. He cited a series of sources that he used as the documentation for this paragraph. So I decided to look them all up. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, all the technical papers were actually available for me to look at. Mm -hmm. And I did follow up. First of all, define what the terms are to find out what they mean. I'll give you a brief section where I explain the background context of that jargon and why suddenly typology doesn't look very helpful. And eventually it's circuited way around to something I had never known about but found out about by following the daisy trail about the Sveka Myrmids. They're okay. at the very base of the wasp ants and the, the primary thing that distinguishes the wasps and the ants is this stupid little metapleural gland, which is this little teeny gland at the back end of its little butt. And here's what was fascinating when I looked into the technical literature. Nobody knows what the hell they do. They've only <laughs> been studied in a few cases. They're presumably in every ant species because they're a diagnostic feature, but almost nothing has been done on them and nobody knows what they secrete. No one's studied that yet. So it's an ongoing question mark. Anyway, oh. Um, the Sveka Myrmids were interesting because there was a paper that I tumbled upon about uh, how ants forage. The queen, when she leaves the nest to set up a new thing, she's got wings and she flies, blop. What happens next? Well, there's two modes. 
The one mode is the queen goes out and has to forage and kill stuff to bring home to feed to the little grubs. Lays its legs because it's had sex with the, with the males and the males are now expendable. Bye. <laughs> and uh, we go on our way. The other approach is the new model, which is the, the queen stay in the nest and secrete gunk just give to her. But she starts out, no workers to play with, the first group. So she dissolves her wings and produces the nutrients that are necessary to feed to her babies until wow. she's got babies to feed her. And that's called the claustral queen. How exactly did this evolve? Well, they're starting to investigate it. And it mm -hmm. turns out that there's a particular shape and structure about muscle dynamics and the connections between one uh, ant segment and another that are highly diagnostic of the flip between the non-claustral foraging queen and the newer version queen and they've, they haven't yet investigated all the genes involved as to what's causing what and I'm sure anti-evolutionists are not going to be the ones to do any of this work but they never what are. was really fun was that on the basis of the shape of the ant and the way the parts were put together this one paper was predicting that Sphica myrmids as basal ants would be cla non-claustral foraging queens because the claustral form evolved later and their body shape is consistent with their being foragers and the fossil genie said, okay, I will have a foraging Sphecomirma queen preserved in amber to prove that hypothesis for you. Thank you very much. Applause, please. So we actually have a thing that confirms the uh, non-claustral nature of the Sphecomirmids as part of the basal ant groups. None of this work, by the way, by anti-evolutionists or participated in by anti-evolutionists and dull as a sack of hammers Michael Denton obviously had no curiosity to look. I found all this information in two days online. That is, that is very That's how quick amazing. it was. All the papers were available full text free because I'm an impoverished scholar. I can't afford to buy effing papers. Uh, so I was able to get all this information. What prevented typologist Michael Denton from finding out all of this stuff so that he could explain it to his readers? I can tell you because he doesn't have any curiosity and his mouse hand apparently is atrophied. Shift going on mm. there. That in, his H, in his HOX13 gene. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah um, I'd also like to tell you about like another... Uh, uh, oh, I can hear myself echoing again. I'd like to tell you about I'd another like one, about, but I also, but I also have a guy uh, who is a... Uh, paleontologist for the uh, Origins Project. Uh, do you mind if I uh, bring him on momentarily? Oh, absolutely. Not only do I not mind, I say yay. All right. His name I is, loved him. He's on Twitter. I want to follow Ludlow. him on Twitter. His name is Bill Oh, Bill Ludlow, Ludlow. Oh, Bill Ludlow is going to debate Kent Hovind later on today. Yes, I'm going to be watching him. All right. Uh, here he comes. Yeah. Bill and I have chit-chatted in other, in other web rooms than that before. Again, he's going to be going after Kent Hovind. Uh, a couple hours later on today, ha ha! So I hope you join. I went, yeah. I I talked to Kent Hovind a, a few weeks ago, yeah. and it was not pleasant <laughs> to say the least. I uh, talked to Kent Hovind by phone in the 1990s. His dime, fortunately. So I too have interacted with Mr. Jump from one thing to another faster than a rabbit on steroids. Oh yeah, he. It, it was crazy about it. Oh, there he is. Uh, what's Hi, crazy? That he... Hey, how you doing? Hello. I'm bending. I'm bending Jackson's ear off on the reptile mammal transition and speaker mermaids. I was listening. I was listening to it. It's awesome. So yeah. I'm enjoying all. Hopefully of it. you've not. You guys hear me? Okay. Stupid. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, and uh, I got to work on the lighting in here. I've got backlighting. I got to deal with. So. Um, yeah, it's kind of blurry. I just got yeah, one it's... light here in the den, and it turned out to be okay. My one problem is my damn glasses reflect uh, the screen onto the thing, so I look like I'm being taken <laughs> over by the you know the. Uh, uh, village of the Dam. There. If my hair was whiter, I would look too. perfectly. Fine. I would look like pants. Well, I'm in my living room, so I, it's like I can't really do that much. I can take I, my doorway over here. I've got. To, I'm going to take a towel or something. Oh and yeah, hang you it got over one that, of those. You know? uh, doors yeah. And there's no uh, blinds on it, so this, the big ball of right. fire and stuff yeah. coming into there. Right. So unfortunately, afternoon, I have to deal with that. So, but um, but I think I can figure that out. Some I think commentary on uh, the mammal fossils and stuff. Um, no, that was awesome. Yeah, I uh, I was just listening. I'm not an expert at all on reptile to mammal transition. I mean, I understand it a bit. I discovered tracks. You know, that's my thing. I found oh, yeah, uh, yeah, technology. Yeah, those are fascinating. Uh, the yeah. thing I was really delighted about 
uh, and uh, it was one of these where I go, whoa, Christine Janis, if you're familiar with her, the mammal paleontologist from Britain, uh, she had been following my work for years and had got slam dunk. And uh, she then suddenly remembered that I'd given her a friend request on Facebook and she finally clicked accept. Uh -huh. And that's when I found out that she had been following my work and had bought my book slam dunk. And I'm going, did you like it? And she says, oh, yes, it's excellent. It's, it's magnificent. I'm, I'm modifying my new mammal book based on the information in your book, all that stuff on the, on the, uh, and the mammal hair found in the Permian. I didn't know about that. I'm going, cool. uh, could you like put like a thing on your Amazon review where you like mention this so other people can know? <laughs> and I had to kind of prod her <laughs> for a couple of days in there. Oh, there's tetrapod tracks. One, two, three, four. Now what, now what, what little critter is this? We're not exactly sure, of course, you know, but this is one of the sets that I found. Um, and uh, I mean, th those according to, I don't know, do you know um, Spencer Lucas? Have you heard of him? Uh, I've got him in my bibliography. I've never interacted with him personally on Twitter or anything. I, yeah. but, but yes, I've got a bunch of his stuff in there. Yeah. I'm doing, uh, with him, I'm doing, um, uh, it's uh, the excavation, the 2nd and 3rd of August. So mm -hmm. we're working what, what's on that. What's that period? Devonian? These are about, they're Coconino sandstone. So they're about 265 to 270 million years old. Man, okay. Yeah, Permian. And they, he's with the New Mexico Museum of Natural History, and they've got the largest collection of Permian tracks in the world there. So, um, you know, he's, oh, yeah. uh, he's and, like and the national so expert correctly. on it. So, yeah. Aside yeah. from being physically impossible to explain in the stupid flood, <laughs> uh, right. it also is telling you about biogeography and climate issues and all that kind of stuff that uh, just are terrible to imagine any, any creationist explaining. And so I, I love it when they bring up subject matter and then it's got like hidden baggage that they neglected to mention. And then I can bring it out and pick the really heavy stuff and go drop. <laughs> right. right. Oh, yeah, biogeography is, is such an intriguing subject. Uh, one of the only thing that that's bothered me in it is how we haven't found a uh, uh, tertiary or Cenozoic marsupials in Africa. That's about the only thing that bothers me. Yeah, yeah, there's a fact that, that one, uh, Casey Luskin blows his horn off on that before he left the Discovery Institute. He's had a whole slew of those. It's a fascinating problem. Uh, one uh, work uh, suggested that it's not merely uh, what we deal with Africa, but also how it gets to the Americas. Okay. There's the, the ocean rafting uh, uh, approach uh, directly from Africa to South America, but also the long way around through the pole and in from Asia. And both of those have logical biogeographical circumstances because the Eocene is really warm and uh, you've yep. got the climate that's very, very different on this. The other thing that I was intrigued that there are at least two island seamounts of island chains that existed in the South Atlantic during the Eocene between Africa and South America. They've all eroded away since and it's only uh, paleo seismic stuff and dredgings up that have revealed it. So we don't know what the hell was living on it because they've all eroded away long ago. But, uh, but there are island chains that theoretically could do that. And the Atlantic was slightly smaller uh, uh, 50 million years ago because of, of uh, plate tectonics. But um, yeah, that's an ongoing problem. Pl other than the fact that, remember, when we're talking about the early primates, we're talking little itty bitty critters that you can hold in your hand. None of these like are big ones of the chip size. So you've got uh, uh, rafting issues and uh, uh, climbing onto some tree that's knocked off in a flood bit. Uh, if there's enough to nibble on, uh, and if they're omnivorous in that, you know, the dynamics. We know of other dispersal things that can go really remarkably long distances, especially if they're small. Well, hey, we, we, there was a, was it the iguana that? that rafted to the that Caribbean island? Yeah, uh, I, think from, I think it went from like Florida on down, and they've yeah. got little, little circumstantial data on that stuff. Uh, I've been uh, accumulating, there's a whole pile of data in my pending file on the biogeography issue because that's one of those that since Luskin has gone out of his way to cast out on, I want to pull that apart like a, like a spider with a fly. <laughs> Let's see. Um... By the way, Luskin... I should point out for my tip work, one of the reasons why I think I, more people ought to support the damn thing, I'm doing research literally nobody else has ever done before. One of the things I'm doing in the tip project that I sort of stumbled into because I suddenly looked down at my spreadsheet and I go, I've got 50,000 sources. I've got 20,000 technical papers. I've got 8,000 anti-evolution pieces. I've got all the sources they cite in my bibliography. 
I can just count those up to analyses of things. Casey Luskin is 15% of the entire intelligent design movement hmm. in my bibliography. He is a colossal, He's a, he was essentially their paleontology department. And uh, I don't know to what extent that, I mean, the, the guy that's picked up the slack now is, is Doofus uh, Klinghoffer, who is just a, a secondary redactor. He, he is clueless. So all he can do is basically copy others. They've got this Beckley guy who's an insect paleontologist and, and a, a signatory of the descent from Darwinism list, which is going to be my next uh, science book, by the way. That's on the, on the uh, uh, hot burner. Uh, nobody's done a proper analysis of that other than a short thing that Rational Wiki did. But anyway, Beckley is a paleontologist, and that's kind of it. Well, design movement. it's interesting that the... the um, well... For one thing, the the petition itself is interesting because, I mean, you should exercise skepticism with regard to any scientific idea. But when when they propose it, that's not their intention. They're slipping in the intelligent design ideas under it, saying it's really vague. And yes. a couple people signed it under the impression that it wasn't an anti-evolution thing, and said what right. when they oh, found have you out heard, the context. You've heard of a Don Exodus too, or Don Exodus? Yeah. Hey, uh, the name doesn't ring a bell, but if I, I, if uh, if there's a, a work on it, I'll. Check. Yeah, he's on he, or was on YouTube. He made a video about where he tracked down or he like eliminated like all the chiropractors and engineers and everything <laughs> on it, and whittled it down to just the biologists. And he contacted mm -hmm. every single one of the biologists who who Ooh. signed it and said, yeah. "Are you aware of what this petition is?" Yeah, let me. No, uh, I didn't know. Uh, Some of them were like, "No, I was a. Uh, uh, this is not what I thought it was." Uh, and so it was. It was a very interesting video. Don Exodus is his name. Yeah, I uh, um. Uh, you uh, put a link. Uh, you, you know about my website. Yeah, I put a link to your website. Website. Yeah, uh, there's comments tabs all in there. So anybody can come in and so you uh, uh, bring in the link. That way you don't have to worry about emailing or, or, or tweeting or any of the other stuff. Oh, I can do it on this YouTube oh, video. By tweet. But I want to have some references on that to make sure I've got that because um, uh, I know, only knew of the Rational Wiki thing and then a few stuff that popped up at the National Center for Science Education. What I'm going to do with the Descent from Darwin list. I've already started the spreadsheet on it. First of all, there's it, there's multiple over the years. It's grown. And one of the things that I immediately noticed as an anal retentive persnickety scholar is where are the new names being added? Going all the way up to like 1100. The new names aren't showing up in the beginning of the list and they're not showing up at the end of the list, but yet the list gets longer. They're always in PDF format. So they must be sprinkling them somewhere in the middle, but the copy in a way that makes it as hard as possible to tell who's on it name searches in PDFs in that nowadays. But the point is they're intelligently designed to make it intimidate you by sheer size. It's not alphabetical. It's never been alphabetical. So they don't want right. you to really be able to see. I know a couple creationists are on it. Baumgartner's on the list and Sanford's on the list. And, and I'll be going through. Also, one of the things that I'm doing in the TIP project is tracking down the scientific vitae of people in the anti-evolution movement. They're what I call the ones that are ones that are at least. Well, let me give you the context. Um, if guess how many anti-evolutionists are fact claimants? The ones that actually make the source claims based upon actual science technical information in the anti-evolution movement currently operating. Put a number up. Five. Hmm? Five. Oh well, it's bigger than that. It's oh, I'm too cynical, you say? <laughs> too cynical. Um, there, there, there are only about three dozen people. Hmm. Tears uh, in the evolution hour. Poor Psy Strike said, "Our viewers are dropping off like flies here because I was <laughs> typing in in the live comment the names of every one of them." So I think uh, Paralogia, I think, was asking about it, and I made the mistake of answering him, and uh, it was boring the tears out of everybody. But there's only 36 people, two dozen of them in the creation science side and a dozen in the intelligent design side. And you can literally put them in a, a, a meeting room at the Holiday Inn. It's that small of a group. They're the ones that generate the core material that everybody else copies. And ask another question. 
since I've been looking up the technical science literature that they are citing, and oh, hi, Puss, and then we've got um, the technical literature that I researched to understand the context of that technical research. At the moment, there's about 3,000 science papers that have been cited by anti-evolutionists. And okay. it, that's probably mm -hmm. nearing an asymptote. There's new ones popping in, but an awful lot of the older creation science material is just going to be reprising the stuff that they keep on copying. So it may go up to 4,000, maybe even 5,000 someday. Mm -hmm. Against the data field, in my bibliography of at the moment 21,600 some odd technical papers, of which I've got almost all of them full text, and that's the key. That's really nice. Not only that, mm -hmm. I list all of the scientists writing them. So although I may cite Schmidlap et al. 2004 in, the, in my work, if you look in the bibliography, if there are 50 authors of, and there often are for genetic papers, yeah. I list yeah. everybody. Which means if a name pops up, I can do a text search in my master bibliography to see if they've done any science technical work. Research if they've done work that is background material. Uh, mm. That 21,000 mm. technical papers are written by 57,000 scientists. I don't have to guess, I'm counting. Uh, so, so it's way more intense than the uh, uh, Project Steve thing that the NCSE did, which was basically one set of authority groups oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. dumping on another set of authority groups. Now, we can ask how many of the, the anti-evolution biz have seats over in the stadium that you need to do the science work stuff, that 57,000. And so far, I have found 60. Your Michael Behes, uh, who was published in PNAS, nucleic acid research. He did stuff yeah. on protein folding yeah. back in the 90s. Scott Minnick is on the list. He's actually done, he's a protein oh. uh, or a, oh. a flagellum guy oh, down amazing. at the University of Idaho. You've, um, heard, of, uh, you've uh, heard of You've heard of the 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 the, prof the atheist professor who destroys evolution video you've heard of that uh, uh i mean lumsden who? richard lumsden oh lumsden let me see let me look him up in my because he was a he was a pathologist i think uh yeah that may be a, a, a more too accurate for words for that guy pathology on the front okay i'm looking it up i got four results for him it's mentioned somewhere and he's in the uh a different one andrew uh, richard uh not so blind or uh, thing uh, creation research society quarterly ah so i've only got one source from richard lumsden from 1994 but because he's in the Creation Research Society yeah, quarterly, right. that means he is a young earth creationist by definition because they don't publish non-young earth creationists. They are fussy. And their fussiness, the same thing with Answers in Genesis Technical Journal and the Answers in Genesis Research Journal, uh, ICR, all of that. However, whatever subject they may be talking about, if they show up in that venue, you know their ideology fits. That's why, you know, Richard Capet or David Capet is a young earth creationist, even if the Discovery Institute can't figure it out. Yeah, uh, uh, there are handfuls of people, particularly legitimate science degrees, but the question yes. is, do they do any of the work? And I actually have found, to my date, there are some science papers that I cite on the basis of its actual content that turn out to have a creationist as co-author. Hmm. And um, both of them are young earth creationists, apparently. Um, and there are two <laughs> out of that. Uh, one is uh, Mark Toleman, who is a, a microbiologist, uh, works stuff on uh, um, uh, various parasite stuff, and uh, perfectly fine scientist within his little niche. How much of a creation it is, we can't really tell, because he's only done one little paper, and I got a thing in tip 1.7. Uh, on it at my website where I go into um, uh, Toleman's one and only foray. It's on biogenesis, and uh, it's it's hilarious. Um, the uh, other biogenesis is something they always uh, when when they come to when they come preach it at LSU. That's something they always bring up. They say, "You've heard of the law of biogenesis?" Yeah, the, the I had a, I have a whole fun section on it. I call it the origins or bust argument. And uh, ironically, uh, uh, Louis Pasteur, who was the object of a lot of authority quoting in this area, um, yeah. could be thought of as kind of a theistic quasi-evolutionist. He really kind of steered clear of it, although Darwin got along extremely well with him and a high opinion of him. So if he had the tiniest flicker of suspicion that evolution was a crock, 
um, Darwin would have probably alluded to it, and Huxley would have lit into him, and so would Alfred Wallace, frankly. And the yeah. fact that there's dead silence on this relating to Pasteur, plus explicitly warn the creationists of 1904, be wary of this biogenesis argument. If you're trying to say that if you can't make life out of little mud puddles, that therefore God is real, what happens if they make life out of mud puddles? Up on your religion? This is a slippery slope. Don't go there. Well, And apparently well, a lot of generators who've never bothered to read their pasture closely uh, have uh, have not dealt with that stuff. I, I cite all that stuff in tip 1.7, so I hopefully people will go over and read my damn shit. I put work into this. Um, the, what's, <laughs> what's, the what's the interesting... Topic? I'm curious. We got to uh, use on to um, hello. Hey, I'm still here. Can oh, you, you just yeah, I just had to turn my, my camera off for a moment. Um, yeah, it's actually uh, uh, oh, well, that's one thing they also talk about. Um, when I give them when I talk about the different experiments that have been done concerning abiogenesis, um, like the uh, creation of, of nucleic acids under like. Uh, extreme heat and pressure, and uh, the experiment, the experiment with cross chirality and RNA. You talk about things like that, and they Bill's say, "Giving you a thumbs up." <laughs> yeah, I got um, a cat on my back too. So, <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, <laughs> but what happens? I used when... to have a cat a long time ago, a little dusty, and she uh, she finally died of a little leg aneurysm. We had to put her down, but she was a sweet little thing. Anyway, so I've, I'm a cat person too. I sympathize. Yeah, I love my little my Enzo. Well, he's kind of tubby, but um. But anyways, so what happens when I when I tell creationists this stuff because they come and they preach it at, at my school is they say, well, if life is produced in the lab, do you think that would prove abiogenesis? And I say, and and I say, well, why wouldn't it? And they say because what that would prove is that intelligent design is necessary to create life. It's like what you are hearing ways. is the application of Greece preemptively to the goalposts so that they can be prepared to move them if necessary. And that's exactly the kind of dodges. How providential of the great designer to have worked out a system whereby life can originate automatically and spontaneously. See what clever providence and design that was. You know, so we know what they're going to do on it. The fun exactly. thing about the exactly. genesis make the reptile mammal transition go away. That is still there whether or not life was a miracle. Uh, billions of years later, but we're learning piece after piece of a lot of the puzzles. Uh, we know that all of not only the uh, amino acids that are used in proteins, but the nucleotides, including the ones in RNA, turn out to be abiotically generatable. And the ones and the amino acids that are most commonly used in proteins are the easiest to generate abiotically. We know that carbonaceous chondrites and all this circumstance. So this stuff generates in space. It doesn't even need terribly friendly environments. Uh, there's a whole stuff. literature on the chirality issue that, that's, that I've been accumulating as well. The, the thing that's intriguing to me is what is the connection between RNA and DNA? And once they figured out our autocatalytic mm -hmm. uh, the and, ribosomes, yeah. uh, they don't form tidy molecules. One of the papers just popped up. I think it was in PNAS. I was just adding it into my bibliography. It's not about biogenesis, but it's really interesting because it's something that um, may have indicated what DNA was doing before it got to be a parasite of RNA and then took over the show. And that is that they've been doing some research about creating artificial um, uh, cytoskeleton structures with tiny Y-shaped DNA fragments. Huh. And that it makes this one, and it'll only work with this DNA. It turns a blob into a protocell. They're using it about the way to packaging stuff for medicines and a whole bunch. It doesn't, it's not, they weren't using this as a uh, biogenesis issue, but it gives you the idea that things are maybe doing stuff over hundreds of millions of years before we get to LUCA, by which time it's now the monotonous DNA coding for RNA. The other thing that there is a good circumstantial case for is that there were fewer amino acids in the original organism before LUCA. Uh, and that it was using a duplex system, not a triplex system. So there were du two codons, not three, to code for a smaller set. Because when you peel away the ones that you can't get in a duplex system, the ones that are still coded for by that duplex core 
are the most commonly used amino acids, the ones that are the easiest to synthesize. So the idea that there's a training wheel system involving a smaller set, that's the current working hypothesis that I'm looking into. Plus, you've got all of these other ones. I can never remember the damn name, pDNA, I think it's the shorting form. The idea that there's a series of, of proto-DNA systems that use different nucleic acids architectures that may have been doing biotic things before the RNA super replicator parasites come in and take over, and then the DNA parasite comes in and hitchhikes on that, and eventually you get this connection between particular codons and particular amino acids in this replicating system. The other relevant issue, uh, Arthur has argued, and I think he's made a really good case about it, is that whatever was the things with origin, metabolism occurs before replication. Because if you don't have a metabolic system, a series of, of hypercycles that are generating food, mm -hmm. the raw materials mm -hmm. to work off of, the moment you have a replicator, it runs amok. It replicate, 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 and it eats up stuff. And if it doesn't have a system that it can hitchhike onto to keep a steady supply of food, it goes extinct. Okay. So uh, replication okay. after metabolism. But apart from that, a lot of question marks. And boy, just want those question marks. So rather than try to figure out uh, the gene systems involved in producing hair follicles from uh, uh, archosaur placodes, mm -hmm. they much rather go, origins are bust, where did life come from, why is there something rather than nothing, where did the universe come from, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I, and, thought, uh, and I, thought, I thought we believed we came from a rock. We believed we came from a rock. Can't hold yeah, it yeah, it's just, just rock, well, or slime. Do you believe you came from slime? <laughs> me, I don't know if you've been following me on Twitter. I've been going uh, uh, jousting with this guy, Preacher, online gospel guy. And I just have fun with him because he is dull as a sack of hammers and, uh, and will repeat crap over it. He will just repeat the same question constantly. I'll answer it, and then he'll no. keep repeating it. No. I'm going, do you have short-term deficit memory disorder or something here? I, I really think you should seek medical attention at once. Yeah. Hey, yeah, guys, then, I got to run. Yeah. I, gotta, I got a couple things I got to do before the debate, and then they're going to Oh, do, yeah, uh, I'll be seeing you on the debate. I, I definitely want to be in for that to yeah. give uh, I want to run, run through it run through my presentation just here once before we start again too so not with you i mean but just you know I'll be offline watching. Yo, or whatever, it, so. with, yeah right. with hope you got to be well prepared because oh, although yeah. as predictable as the sunrise he still moves like grease lightning and you've got to be able to know, oh, know. the dodges to slow him down long enough to deal with a particular yeah. problem is yeah, it going to be my, more that was my problem format? What's is that? it going to be more of a conversational format after the initial presentation? No, I'm I'm giving a I'm giving an initial presentation. It's probably about twenty minutes long. Um, basically, uh, like a presentation like he does, you know, mm -hmm. you know in his his things. Um, he may respond with something similar. We'll have to see if he. Sometimes he has a TV set setting behind him here, and he does that kind of thing. Mine will mm -hmm. be up on the screen, just like I showed you the image of those tracks, you know. And I'll be mm -hmm. I'll be going right through them. It's a fast moving presentation. I mean, I'm going to go through about 40 slides in 20 minutes, you know. Or, or even, I mean, it's not like I, I sit and dwell on anything. I go one, boom, 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 boom. On if the you next. have examples in the wings of where you can be anticipating a Hovind thing to where you can say, yeah. Hovind has discussed this point, and here's why he's well, wrong. I thought about doing that in my initial presentation, and I backed off because I know what he's going to say. I figure, why not? know what he's going to say let him say what i know he's going to say and then after i do my presentation he he says his normal thing and then i i'm totally prepared to rebut all that mm, yeah and uh, there I, I, my I, approach is always source methods never let hovind off the hook as to what sources he allegedly draws on because hovind right. is not a fact claimant he's not one of that 36 he is a secondary redactor. Nothing he has ever done is original. He simply siphoned off somebody else. And if you ask him point blank, how did you fact check this point of information? I bet he's going to go into deer in the headlight mode because he will right. honestly, he will not tell you that he fact checked a specific source when he didn't. He'll just go into Tortukan deflection mode and he'll start talking about something else. And yeah. I, I've always yeah. wanted to test that out with him to see if, if he bumps into that because I'm my working hypothesis is creationists are honest people and they, they're delusional, but they're still honest. And so they will not 
And all the creationists I've ever bumped into, especially all the blatherers on Twitter, I've never heard once any of them make up a non-existent source. They've always repeated somebody else's material. But when I ask them, mm -hmm. how did you fact check that? Oh, whoop, they fall off the cliff because they will not bear false witness. They won't claim to have fact checked something they haven't. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I will see you guys. Bye, Bill. Soon, see you later. Will, uh... Thank right, you for coming on. Bye. All right. Thank you for now having it's me. Back to just Jackson and me. Am I filling up your, your time okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, I told you uh, yesterday we could do an hour and a half if you wanted to, or we could go over it. I mean, whichever I works am, for you. I'll go and get you all the plug, kid, or until we got to okay. move out because it's like 2 o'clock or so. That, no, 2.30. His Bill, Bill Ludlow hits up there, and I'll probably want to be kind of edging in because I'm an old fart, so I have to go through the please lead me through the links uh, thing to make sure that I'm on the connection and all of that. The computer starts up the, the damn camera automatically. At least it does that. I like a no user serviceable parts world where mm -hmm. I just do the things so I don't bother changing the oil on my car. Let a professional do that. Right. Uh, and I'm the same way with the, with the computer technology. But I try to make use of it uh, bit by bit. I, I've advanced to the point where I can talk to people across the continent about fun stuff and do it real time. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. It is pretty amazing. Yeah, we've, uh, yeah, we can do it. I, I did want to. Uh, we keep coming to topics that kind of surround it, and I keep, I keep thinking about it, but then we move on to something else, and I forget about it again. Um, it was another one of those we were talking about the uh, the fossil genie earlier, uh, and so I wanted to point out that one of the one of the pieces of information I came across was an article on these uh, Archaeans called uh, Loki Archaeota. Mm. And so these well, guys. So they're called Loki Archaeota because they're found in this uh, area of it's like between uh, like Iceland and Norway or something like that. It's this volcanic area. So basically, they predicted that um, if eukaryotes evolved from Archaeans, which we're pretty pretty sure they did, um, then there should be some organisms. There should be some Archaeans that have these specific cellular traits, including uh, ESCRT genes or and some other things, which which is involved in like a was it phagocytosis? I think something like that. Uh, so basically, they predicted that an organism with these cellular characteristics would be found, and surely enough, looky there, they found one. Yeah, yeah. The name rings a bell. I, I tried to look at my bibliography to see if something popped up under any of those, but not. But I, I remember getting a thing on it. This brand new cutting edge stuff because I only just found the damn thing. Uh, yeah. Another one of my little favorites are the Chihuahua flagellates uh, that just are chock a block. Oh, yeah. Those are awesome. Yeah, because the, the, uh, uh, they're just like the uh, coanocytes on, on sponges. They're yeah. a lot like them. I'll give a plug to yep. Eugene Coonan, and it's readily available online. Uh, Coonan has done a paper from, in nucleic acids research uh, from 2009. Let me see if I can. I found the nature him. paper. I found the nature and, paper. Uh, uh, look. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. This one, uh, Coonan is just one of the super geniuses. He is just spectacular. And in fact, I, when I discover that he's a, an author on a particular paper, I go, "No wonder I'm interested in this." Anyway, it's a thing on um, bum, bum. It's Darwinian evolution in the light of genomics, and it was in nucleic acid research in 2009, and it is available online free because all nucleic acid research is open access after like a year or so. It's like PNAS now. It, it didn't start out that way, but now it is. And um, it's like a Christmas in July cornucopia paper. Wow. It's a survey of all the work that he is aware of on the how multicellularity systems developed and all the different bacterial groups that have got the components. I knew about a lot of the work, but there was a lot I didn't know because it's his yeah. field. And this was like candy store stuff. Now, it got even better before Casey Luskin left the Discovery Institute. Because remember, in my tip project, I keep track of who cites technical papers. I don't right. need to know the name, but that somebody cited it. And this 2009 paper, nobody had ever cited it in the anti-evolution literature until Casey Luskin. He was the very first one. Was he citing it on its content? Nope. All he cited it on was as an authority bit on like a, a minor mutation rate issue. It's just completely trivial in terms of the content. But huh. I have a thing I call the Dracula rule. 
if you're familiar with Dracula, he can't enter the house until you invite him in. But once he invited right. in, he can come right. in on his own. That's the Dracula rule. And mm -hmm. that means if mm -hmm. the moment Luskin cites that paper, every single one of these topics that are addressed, where I have this pile of fascinating primary source papers that I will track down, I'll go. And by the way, Casey Luskin could have known about this because it was in the, the Kunin paper that he cited in so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And I'll be able to do that again and again and again because of the Dracula rule. So I now know the information that he was literally stepping over. Um, yeah. Oh, if you don't have a, a, a particular topic here, I'd love to discuss the scoop that I have on Michael Denton and the bit about the, the mammal job because that kind of on how uh, the, the methods approach and how knowing the original source matters to be able to read that. Okay, yeah, I just um, wanted to uh, add uh, uh, one more thing before uh, we go into that. Uh, you were talking about the like coin of coin flagellates and and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard of like uh, adhesomes and integrins and receptor tyrosine kinases. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's a ton of stuff on that. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, because it's like these all these parts that are necessary for cell cell relationships are found in these unicellular organisms and it's like well why the heck are they there why do they need yeah. adhesomes which are meant for connecting cells They're or integrins and then they yeah, get yeah. co-op it's what that stephen j gould calls either an exaptation or more specifically a spandrel uh, and uh, that's one of his wonderful little terms that pops up in fact in the in the the, the dawkins gould of the 1970s and 80s and 90s. Um, in re retrospect, uh, Dawkins lost and Gould won. More Dawkins, con fewer Dawkins concepts are used actively in the sciences than uh, Gould stuff. Uh, punctuated equilibrium is just part of the of the lexicon now. Mm -hmm. And spandrel, uh, you find technical papers where they'll say language as a spandrel, <laughs> and yeah. uh, that's because it looks like that. And in fact, I'll define religion for you. It's a neotenous spandrel that is sustained as a scorched earth defense. <laughs> <laughs> we'll goodness. have to do a discussion of that sometime. But anyway, yeah, we will have to. Um, Michael, just as I was writing, uh, uh, Michael Denton's new book came out, uh, Evolution Still a Theory in Crisis. And it not, was being lauded all of <laughs> mm -hmm, Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, that's uh, ironic. Uh, I, I, I must tell you that it's un extremely unlikely that Michael Denton pays close attention to Todd Wood. Um, uh, anyway. This was one of their big new guns, and but Denton is at the top of their food chain. He uh, even, in spite of its clumsiness, because Denton is not religious, he's an agnostic, and so he doesn't have the religious baggage. He's coming at it purely as a scientific. And yeah, who knows where he may end up? But at the it's moment, like I'm willing. To, it's like eh. well, Berlinski is the king of the Tortugans. He's in a weird planet all of his own. We could do a whole show on Berlinski. Anyway. Oh, okay. um, but anyway, Denton is a, a formidable character. And I knew if I'm going to be writing a thing on the reptile mammal, I needed that information. So I hit on um, uh, Glenn Branch from the NCSE to say, uh, can I, if you have that book, can I have the information from it? Yeah. And they didn't. They had not planned on buying their book. And he talked them into buying the book, shipping it to me from Amazon. I then took all of my information out of it and then shipped it back to them. Hmm. Uh, hmm. And all of that took out. So they, the reason that so I now know that the NCSE has a copy of Denton's book. And so when I went through it, I not only was looking at the reptile mammal transition information, but because I'm now in full tip mode, I went through and tracked down all of his source citations that he does in the book. Hmm. And fortunately, it was a little easier because he has a bibliography. Some of the others, like Jonathan Wells, don't do that. And so you got to ferret around much more. Well, the hard Jonathan Wells, icons of evolution. Well, jo uh, Jonathan Wells was angling for the Dwayne Gish of intelligent design until Casey Luskin came along. And Luskin's oh. diuretic profligacy just completely eclipsed him. It, you know, he just blew. <laughs> I got 400 sources of Casey Luskin in there. He is gigantic. And Good huge thing. chunks of the Discovery Institute approach to apologetics is Casey Luskin. Oh, yeah, he is, uh, uh, even though he's left the group now, his methodology is essentially what they do in all of their work. And once you see how Luskin assembles an argument, you are seeing how virtually all intelligent designers do that. And I met him. He's a charming little fellow. Uh, he doesn't think about things he doesn't want to think about. Uh, in fact, I, I, I made a point of calling attention to the fact that I rip him apart. 
in, uh, um, uh, in Troubles in Paradise, and apparently he didn't pay any attention to it. He had never really heard about the reptile mammal transition. Mm, slipped his mind, I guess. This, by the way, was years after he was extolling uh, 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 evol Explore Evolution as a wonderful, or Design of Life as a wonderful book, and explicitly on its account of the reptile mammal transition. Design uh, of so, Life? Oh, yeah, the, the Dembski Wells' book. Uh, I go into that in detail. Oh. In fact, uh, Christine Janis, that was her favorite section of the book where I pull apart Dembski uh, and Wells on the, on the Design of Life discussion, because essentially I had... Uh, the one revision I would make in, in a redo uh, is that I finally resolved another question because I was at a thing where Wells was speaking earlier in the year and I came up to ask a question. Ironically, I was the only one who was coming up to ask a question. It was like crickets. And I came up to the microphone like and I said, church. come on, there are none of you here in this bunch of design advocates here that can well ask this guy a question. Anyway, um, I was asking him what his contribution was to the reptile mammal transition section of the design of life. With I feel like you're going to say you hit a nerve. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he just said to my surprise that he didn't have anything to do with it. It was all Dembski. Uh, he did, contributed very little to the book. And I really? actually had a jaw drop moment because Dembski has no interest in paleontology at all. He would only cite Denton, and then later on he added icons of evolution to non-paleontologists. And Wells, at least, would bump into stuff. And I really thought he had had some input in here. So this disinterest was actually quite surprising to me. Hmm. Uh, hmm. And that, that was a, a little data point that really I was unexpected. Anyway, uh, the design of life turns out to be a pathetic retread of, of pandas and people complete with all of its mm -hmm. mistakes and the wrong animal illustrated <laughs> because it is uh, because pandas and people shows an intermediate therapsid as the reptile skull not a reptile <laughs> oops mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and then the then the, the other one that now becomes a fascinating issue to me is the morganucodon case because uh, in the '93 version a, a of pandas basal, uh, mammal mammaliform, mammal, mammaliform. yeah, uh, it's one of the very early mam mammals, and it's uh, it's the one taxa that Jonathan or that Philip Johnson mentions in the uh, uh, Darwin on Trial. Have you read uh, Darwin on Trial? I have read uh, very few creationist books. One of which I actually received from my grandmother. But um, oh, well, this is this would be intelligent design, and it is the Mount Olympus the intelligent design for, books for the design movement. Yeah, well, it, although it's creationism light, it has a lot of influence on people, and, and your Rick Santorum types will be channeling material from the Design Institute bunch, not creationism, although others, like Blunt or Brunt or whatever his name was, that was evol uh, Big Bang is a, is a live Satan straight from hell. Uh, he's a young yeah, Earth creationist. Of yeah. Comes from a young Earth creationist background. So you got to know the playing field. But anyway. Uh, back to our, our uh, cute little pal of uh, Dembski Wells. Um, in Darwin on Trial, Philip Johnson says that these animals are put in an arbitrary relationship by uh, uh, Hobson in his 1987 article uh, from the American biology teacher. And Morganucodon is actually older uh, than the um, uh, fossils that it's supposedly, or younger than the ancestors that it's supposedly ancestral to, something like that. I've heard, yeah, I've heard stuff like that before. And it turns out pandas makes exactly the same claim. Well, boy, are they head up their ass wrong on this because Hobson's article says no such thing. <laughs> exactly, quite to the opposite. It, it's just gobsmacking how perfectly aligned the taxa are marching in lockstep if you look at them and you put them in the in the chronological order and you relate them as to where they are in the cladistic analysis. And he says, uh, with extreme understatement, Hobson was saying, it's remarkable how well they match the two sequences because they match 100%. There's no exceptions to it. And Morganucodon certainly wasn't. So where exactly did this come from? And now this now raises a little scholarly point. When once I discovered a little more about this, now the question comes, who stuck their head up their ass first on this Morganucodon thing? Uh, was it pandas or was it Johnson? And that's mm -hmm. one of the, when if I do a revamp or if somebody has a copy of the 1989 version of Pandas and People, I will, I'll, I'll, eventually I'll have to ding um, uh, NCSE for it. And I'm sure they'll give me a little because they've done this with me before. I want to have 
the, the text of the 89 version on the reptile mammal transition, which is probably no more than two pages, and probably where the notes are, which will be at the end of the chapter, because I got to see the references. Mm -hmm. Because right. if right. Pandas makes this claim about Morganucodon in 89, then it means Philip Johnson is copying it in 91. If it isn't in the 89 version, it means that 93 version is copying Philip Johnson because it's such a specific mistake that it tells you who's copying who. And all right. I need to do is to have the 89 right. version that that will resolve it. Scholarship, Jackson, is a context sport. And it is really is ruthless it, um, because yeah. tell lots of stuff about things. Now, so get back to Denton and the, and the job. Uh, right. we, uh, right. Short presses, we've got the fact that we got the dentary bone and in the reptile, we've got the articular bone behind it and we got the quadrate. I've mentioned all that stuff before. Now, Denton does not dispute any of this stuff. He accepts it. He doesn't cite a damn source on it at all. None of the technical literature. So he's just racing by on his skateboard 90 miles an hour. And instead, he pulls out his mantra, which is, oh, those Darwinists. They cannot even imagine an adaptive Darwinian scenario to explain this jaw transition. <laughs> and he now cites a source a source and it is a paper science magazine on the bite force dynamics of tyrannosaurs and uh, crocodiles and his denton's argument is that these little tiny little bones back here with their weak little jaw can't possibly be dynamically forcing this adaptive change well this big dentary bone because they can't make this bite force that we can see and these things are driven by chomp 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 which we can see in tyrannosaurs and archosaurs and crocodiles. Now, if all I had was the abstract, I would be able to blow several holes in his argument. I was prepared to do that. First, synapsids are not diapsids. Two skull holes, one skull hole, muscle attachments different, dynamic things different. Why are you using archosaur diapsids as a thing to beat over the head of a synapsid? Problem number one. Problem number two. Who says these little tiny bones back here are driving the adaptive change? Why can't it be the dentary bone itself? la di da That's as far as I could have gone without seeing the original source. But then I got the original source. Now, Science Magazine is normally behind a paywall, but somebody had it on, I think it was on ResearchGate or whatever, but I have the whole paper now. And, oh boy, it was much more interesting than that. First of all, it was a really nice paper. And ironically, there is a the key was this chart. There was a chart that showed um, uh, a straight line. I'll try to boom by hand because everything's backwards when I try to do things on camera. So uh, bear in mind, I'm an old fart and I have trouble with these things. Anyway, there was a chart line where you start out with um, human beings down here. So they actually had some synapsids on the list, us. And then the line went up and up and up. And there's your crocodiles and up and up and up to uh, uh, tyrannosaurs. And what it was a graph of was bite force versus skull size. And so it is that tyrannosaurs, they don't know that they have an exceptionally strong bite, given how big their damn jaw is. It's just a bite force size from jaw size. And these are predators. These are um, uh, uh, predators, uh, apex predators in particular. Uh, fine and dandy. Are we getting me okay still for sound? Not getting you. Yeah, I'm not getting you on sound, but are you hearing me? Okay, so thumbs up if you're still hearing me. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, hopefully there's still sound. Yeah, but I'm not getting you at all. So you got your microphone muted or the demons again who don't like the fossil genie. Anyway, um, buried on that cute little chart, remember we got our nice little line that goes up like this. Buried down in this corner were a blob. And they have a little footnote for the blob, and that is insectivores are a notable exception to the bite force rule. They have really mild bite forces for the size of their jaw. Why? It's because of what they eat, insects. And there was a technical paper that was cited. And therefore, in principle, Michael Denton could have known about it because it was in the paper he cited. I looked up that, and that opened up a cornucopia of information I didn't have until I followed up the trail on this. So the first number was about insectivores. That is 
imagine uh, uh, part of the problem was for me conceptually ironically is that this issue hadn't really been discussed in any of the works and i had literally had the information under my nose for years including the hobson article that denton and everybody else was aware of um that nobody ever really talked about so i didn't get the gist on it and that had to do with the shape of the dentary bone if you've seen these cute little charts of the reptile mammal transition most of them will show the skull from the side so you got this nice, and I'll turn around to the side here. So you've got this nice dentary bone sticking out like that and all that. And, and you can see the expansion of the thing and the coronoid process and that as you move through the cycle. Blah -dee -dum. What was interesting about this is what if you look at the thing looking down on it? And for all this time, it had been staring me in the face. If you look at our own uh, jaw, we've got a great big arc. It's like a horseshoe shaped jaw, the teeth of the dentary bone, and then the skull behind it. And it forms like a big oval. And even if you look down at a tyrannosaur or a crocodile, they've got a dentary bone that's quite long and like a big wide V, and then a skull that connects out from that. And I'm not showing my little images up on the screen. There we go. So it comes down kind of like that, and then does a big bulge out like that. Uh, and that's true of your uh, tyrannosaurs and uh, crocodiles and all of these ones. And that generates these strong bite force. What you get with insectivores is very different. And you get this, look up here, ridiculously narrow, narrow, narrow pipette shaped thing. And then a bulging skull that comes out. It looks frankly like a penis of shape. Boom. Very distinctive. And I had seen these for years. There were a whole slew of looking down on pictures of Morganucodon and uh, probanognathids and all the rest. And I'd never really paid any attention to it until I followed up on this research. If you imagine a little insectivore and it encounters bug and it goes chink, and it goes chink, 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 chink. It turns out an extremely long, narrow dentary bone automatically, just on the basis of the way the little curvy teeth are shaped, pulls the bug into the mouth just by the act of chomping. Bite force. That's how insectivores get their by. And they get the little bug far enough back in that really long dental arcade, and it squishes and breaks that little shell, and it gets all the nice buggy parts inside to eat. Not only is the shape of the dentary bone in these insectivores adaptive, but biologists had known all about it all along, and Denton could have followed this trail himself had he wanted to. Uh, it, it, that, to my mind, is just a beautiful measure. I saw it with the ants, where he never bothered to look up metapleural glands. I saw it with feathers, where he was stepping around the information there. And then my cherry on top um, is maple leaves. Um, he had been preening at the Discovery Institute in the pre-publication for the book about how maple leaves, Darwinians cannot even imagine an adaptive scenario to explain why maple leaves are shaped the way they are. And it turned out, A, in his book, he never bothered to mention maple leaves, <laughs> which really surprised me. And two, I researched maple leaf shape. And first of all, maples are not a species, they're a genus. And their maple leaf shape varies depending upon their latitude and the moisture and the serration format of leaves in general and maples in particular are due to the desiccation dynamics between the amount of moisture they have to retain in an environment where it gets hot and occasionally and cold and therefore it is oh dare i use there's a word for that what is it oh it's an adaptation <laughs> and he had never seen the science material and i'm still not getting any sound from you oh am i and i'm are you getting no sound from me Oh boy. Well, we maybe I let let me jump out and pop back in and see if that helps. So I'm going to leave temporarily. I'm going to hit that little swirly circle up there. Okay, we're coming back in. We're coming back in, and I'm still not getting any sound from you. Yeah. Oh, dear. Well, are we going to have to end it then because of all that? Hopefully, we got a little bit of the stuff before the, the crash. I uh, hope people will uh, re not regard me as an idiot. Um, anybody who has, has 
money burning a hole in their pocket, they can find links to my books all at the website. I don't know whether or not anybody sees this or not. Let me pump this in to see whether or not any of this shows up anywhere. Um, because there is a window in here. Boop. And they can just go to there and they can find direct links to uh, all the formats of the book and my novel, too, uh, Paralogues of Phileas Fogg. If you like mystery, science fiction, steampunk retelling of around the world in 80 days and a whole bunch else uh, that's historically accurate and scientifically amazing and has electric guns and uh, atomic powered flying machines and whatever is in that box in Chicago uh, and uh, Phileas Fogg with his watch and Passepartout with his comb, it's a rip snorting good yarn. Uh, as well as my science book. So they can make it a double feature. Uh, but anyway, thank you for having me in a conversation. Hopefully, maybe we'll want to have chats again. 45 minutes away from uh, uh, Bill's um, uh, going after Kent Hovind, somebody who um, be looking at it from, uh, oh, once you tell them about your book, could you say bye and thank you? Okay. Uh, uh, bye and thank you. Bye bye. See, I tend to talk indefinitely. You got to tell me to shut up. That's what you got to do. Thank you very much, Jackson. Goodbye.